So from the very moment that the disciples finally encounter Christ and know who he is, consciously, he passes out of their sight. And so from the very beginning, Christians are left in anticipation of his coming. The New Testament doesn't speak of a second coming. It just speaks of his coming. We are waiting for his coming. We're waiting for the one of whom we previously had no knowledge, no comprehension. He appears and he disappears simultaneously. Or rather, you could even say he appears in his disappearance. He appears in his passing out of this world. In this, he creates in us a desire for his coming and a trace of his presence. As Augustine put it in the Confessions, he says, Through him you sought us when we were not looking for you, but you sought us that we might begin to look for you. Yeah? For from the beginning, we are stretching forward, looking for him. So the Apostle Paul urges us to forget what, lay behind, what lies behind, but rather to respond to the upward call of God in Christ Jesus, knowing our citizenship is in heaven, from whence he will come. Jesus Christ, for Christians, is always the coming one. He's not simply the one who is coming in a second coming, but he's always the coming one. We're waiting from the beginning for his coming. And even in the New Testament, in the Gospels, he's described as the coming one. The example of um, John the Baptist is a clear one with that. When John the Baptist was in prison... He started to have doubts. He sent message to Jesus and he asks, are you the coming one or should we look for another? Are you oechomenos or should we look for another? And Jesus typically doesn't give an answer. What he says is, go back, tell John what you've seen, that the lame are walking, the blind are seeing, the, the sick are healed. Go back and tell him that. It's not an answer. It's only an answer if you go back to Isaiah to know what those signs might mean. Yeah? Now, the reason I've gone through all of that at such length is because what's important for us here is how it is that the disciples come to know Christ. That he is the Lord, that he is the Son of God. They didn't come to know this by hearing reports about him, about his birth from his mother or anything like that. They didn't know this by accompanying him for a period of time. Nor was it seeing him on the cross, nor was it seeing the empty tomb, nor was it seeing the resurrection, which did all of this. Rather, they came to know him as the one whose passion was spoken about in the scripture, and then they understand him, they encounter him in the breaking of bread. When the Spirit descends at Pentecost as the one promised by Christ, he comes as the one who will teach us all things about Christ, lead us into all truth. And it's only after all of this that, as the Gospel of John puts it, the disciples finally realize that the scripture was fulfilled in Christ. Only now can they look back and see, yes, indeed, this is what Isaiah was talking about, this is what Moses was talking about, this is what the lamb at the Passover was, was signifying, and so on. Engagement with scripture i.e. literature and the breaking of bread, the two fundamental aspects which, comes, which, which form the matrix and the nourishment of revelation. The matrix, the womb, the fabric um, within which the revelation actually occurs and then the breaking of bread in which it is manifest. So Christians, therefore, are the ones who read Scripture to encounter Christ. The revelation is fundamentally a literary revelation. We come to know God through his word. Hence, we need all the disciplines of word to be able to engage with that revelation. And really, that is what Christians do in church. We use the language, the imagery, the poetry of scripture in the poetry of hymnography, in the orthodox tradition, likewise in the artistry of iconography, in the ritual of liturgy, in which we break bread and encounter him and in fact become his body. That's why he disappears. If we are his body, how could we look at him elsewhere? 
We engage with all of this to praise God for what he's wrought in Christ by the Holy Spirit. And therefore, in this sense, the church is the matrix, which is a Latin word for womb, in which we come to put on the identity of Christ. We receive his body and become his body. In a very, very real sense, there is no historical distance between us now and those on the road to Emmaus. Yeah? Being there 2,000 years ago was not an advantage for them. And so likewise, us being 2,000 years later, we're not at a disadvantage. Being there didn't help them. In fact, it made it more difficult for them. You know, they, they thought they knew who he was. They didn't get it. There is no historical distance in that. Now, as the early Christians, especially Irenaeus and Clement, who I mentioned earlier, as they begin to articulate how all of this holds together, how it becomes normative, why this is the way to go rather than Valentinian Gnosticism or whatever else it might be, they appeal to what they call the canon of truth. Eventually it becomes a creed, but it's a canon of truth to begin with. And what they mean by that is not simply a list of revealed truths that you have to believe for the simple fact that they're revealed, but rather the canon of truth for them is more precisely the articulation, the crystallization, the expression of what they call the hypothesis, which would be really the presupposition. The presupposition one must have if one is to look at all of this and see it correctly. Irenaeus gives the example of a mosaic. He likens a scripture to a mosaic. If you look at it from the right hypothesis, you can see the whole of scripture as a mosaic and see the image of a king. If you start with a different hypothesis, you look at all of this and see the image of a fox. Yeah? How are you looking at it? What's your starting point for looking at it? And really, it's a starting point that is most important. The hypothesis. Think about the example of the Apostle Paul. You know, we spend so much of our time in theological programs studying the interpretation of Scripture, the Old Testament. Yeah? And we spend so much of our time trying to understand what a first century Jew might have understood by it. Well, Paul was a first century Jew. Okay? He was tra trained in, in various rabbinical schools. He was doing all this, that, and the other. He knew the Scriptures inside and out. But did it lead, it to, did it lead him to Christ? No. He thought he was righteous. He thought he was, you know, a Jew of the Jews, a Pharisee of the Pharisees. I'm righteous with respect to the law, and you Christians have got it messed up. You're wrong. You're blaspheming. Yeah? So he persecutes the church. He encounters Christ on the road to Damascus. Why are you persecuting me? Okay. And then as a result, he's illumined, and he can now read Scripture differently. The text hasn't changed. His starting point has changed. Yeah? The starting point is the all-important fundamental principle. The starting point, the hypothesis. It's the starting point for seeing anything. It becomes a canon, articulated more fully, it becomes a canon, the criterion of faith. As a starting point, or what the ancients would call a first principle, they knew that it could not be proved. If you could prove it, you'd have to prove it by reference to something else. And then that becomes your starting point. Yeah? If you could prove that, you have to do it by reference to something else. Then that would become your starting point. You'd end up in an infinite regress with no knowledge whatsoever. So Clement of Alexandria, following on from Epicurus, following on from Aristotle, he points out that all knowledge, and he means it very strictly, whether it's mathematics, physics, whatever it might be, all knowledge depends upon a first principle. Even empirical knowledge depends upon the first principle that you can trust your eyesight. Yeah? And we know that can be mistaken. So what's the first principle that you're going to start on? If all knowledge depends upon a first principle, Clement points out, that first principle depends upon faith. You have to accept it by faith. If you could prove it, be proving it by reference to something else, that becomes your starting point. So for the early Christians, and for the Christian tradition thereafter, I would argue, faith is not opposed to reason, but in fact, faith enables reason. Without a credible first principle accepted by faith, reason cannot work. It will get lost in an infinite regress. 
And interestingly, that's the same argument which both Irenaeus and the Neoplatonic philosopher Plotinus will both use against Gnosticism. They've got no credible starting point, no credible first principle. So, there is intrinsically a scriptural dimension to our encounter with Christ. And this requires of us a knowledge of how letters work. It requires of us that we learn, as St. Gregory of Nazianzus put it, we learn the principles of inquiry and, co and contemplation. Okay. So, we've looked at examples of this from antiquity. I've offered a theological explanation of why this should be so. We've seen it justified in the idea of plundering the Egyptians. But I would go further and point out there's another reverse side to this plundering of the Egyptians. And this is in the way that early Christians would speak about the seeds of the word being implanted in all, in everyone. Clement of Alexandria spoke of that. So did Justin Martyr in the middle of the second century. He held that the word of God is in all creation as the logos spermaticos, the sowing word, the word who scatters seeds of, of himself in everything. Okay. Usually people take, trace that back to some kind of stoic background, but it would seem much more natural to take it from the parable in the gospel about the one who scatters the seeds. The seed is sown everywhere. The word of God as a logos spermaticos implants in human beings a seed, a sperma, which enables them to think and live and act in accordance with the word. The word seed um, can be understood in two different ways. When we tend to think of a seed today, we tend to think of something which is intrinsic, which will grow. That is, you know, You've got, you've got the fullness of something already in the seed and all it needs is nourishment to grow. But the word seed can also have the other um, resonance of that which is sown. That which is not there naturally, but that which is sown, that which is implanted by the logos. So he says, uh, the logos spermaticos, the sowing word, sows seeds of himself everywhere. And this enables some, such as Plato and Socrates, to be able to have a, a dim comprehension of the word of God, to live and think in accordance with the word, or at least attempt to do so. And so, Justin says, Christ was partially known even by Socrates. 